You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Okay, we're live, but we got to let the stream breathe just for a few seconds to ensure that we are getting green check marks across the board. We're live. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle, powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, and with me, as always, is my partner in crime. You know him. You love him. He is my fellow football priest. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, we signed off on Monday knowing, of course, that the Broncos had planned to comb the free agent market in the league, looking for some a little bit of help and support at quarterback. Were you surprised that the quarterback they landed on ended up being Blake Bortles? You know what? No. I, I am a little surprised considering that Locke's not on injured reserve, so it's not a long-term injury. The Broncos think by their actions and by their words, he's going to be back within you know two, three, four weeks tops. Why would you bring in a guy who offers you no – I think no higher upside than Jeff Driscoll. This is a guy who floundered out of Jacksonville, Chad, who literally is the Mark Sanchez of this past generation, this past half decade, with the mistakes that he made. And he only was successful because he was on a winning team in Saxonville. So this strikes me as Elway kind of going back to his old reliable ways and going after a veteran quarterback, no different than Keenan or Joe Flacco. Blake Bortles has a name. And as soon as Elway got a chance to again, he said, you know what? I tried the, the young route. I tried going with Locke. Didn't work. Let me go back to old reliable. And that's the free agent market for a quarterback. If it's a short term injury, I don't know what Blake Bortles is going to bring the Broncos that Jeff Driscoll didn't already demonstrate on the field against Pittsburgh, Chad, to throw for two touchdowns and keep the Broncos in that game against a tough defense on the road cold. I think earned him the, the the bridge starts until Locke is healthy. So uh, knowing me, I'm not crazy about the Bortles move. I understand they needed insurance and a healthy body, but how about replacing the right tackle first? I wish they would have come for a right tackle. That's what got the quarterback injured in the first place. But my thoughts on Bortles, I think, are, are very well established by now. But yeah, the Broncos had every opportunity to sign Blake Bortles to make him the backup, the fail safe to Drew Locke. They ultimately chose Jeff Driscoll. There's nothing that's going to change that in the short term, barring an injury to Jeff Driscoll. And it's good news because the Denver Broncos opted not to place Drew Locke on injured reserve. Now, his timetable officially, as it's been reported, is two to six weeks. The Broncos are hoping, and I think they're believing, because of of its uh, relative uh, severity of the injury, it wasn't that severe of an injury. But because it's his right, you know, they got to, it's his throwing arm. They got to do two to six window, a uh, week window. But I think they're very optimistic that he, he can keep it on the lower end of that prognosis. So two weeks, I, I still am kind of telling fans, look, probably just plan on three weeks, three games. You get Drew Lock. This is week three, week four, week five. Then you get him back week six. And one of the reasons for that being that the middle game in there is, is the Thursday night game against the New York Jets. But, Blake Bortles, look, he's a he's just a, a another fail safe in case Driscoll gets hurt, and Driscoll could get hurt if you guys saw against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Knock on wood, he missed a lot of you know pre snap uh, pressures uh, and took some kind of silly sacks that a more experienced quarterback. And even just having that one game is probably going to rid him and the and seeing the film and being out there himself and realizing what he failed to recognize. He talked about that today. In fact, Zach having his making sure his eyes are, are disciplined and whatnot. But he's he's going to get hit a lot. This offensive line, they're not moving off Elijah Wilkinson, as we talked about on Monday. So there there is that chance that you worry that, you know, they might have to fall back on Blake Bortles. This is more than anything kind of an indictment on Brett Rippon. They just don't right. – I don't even know why they're bothering with Brett Rippon. If, they, if they're not even going to give him a two- to three-week window to be the backup – why do you even have him on the roster, Zach? That's what I want to know. It's, why do they have DeMar Dawson on the roster if they're not going to play him at right tackle? This is more questionable personnel decisions by Elway and the Broncos front office. And let me just 
posit one thing. If Jeff Driscoll goes down, is Blake Bortles the one to save this season? Is he the one to be the savior? How much better will the Broncos be with Bortles than they would be with, with Brett Rippon? Now, keep in mind, Rippon knows the playbook. Driscoll knows the playbook. Bortles does not know the playbook. He's coming in cold now after two weeks of the regular season. Again, I understand it from a logistics move and a personnel move, but I think Jeff Driscoll is the better quarterback to lead the Broncos until Locke gets back, and there's no damn way that Blake Bortles is taking Drew Locke's starting job, Chad. Any Broncos fan thinking that's going to happen, like you said, it's not an indictment on anyone except Brett Rippon. Exactly. I mean, it's kind of interesting, though. The ties, I didn't realize this until today. And by the way, I'm going to grab the Super Chat one second. I didn't know this until today. And credit to, gosh, I can't remember now who brought this to my attention, but um, Jeff Driscoll and Blake Bortles, they were crosstown rivals in the hometown as football prospects. And what's ironic about it in high school, what's ironic about it is coming out of high school, Blake Bortles felt like he was always playing in the shadow of Jeff Driscoll because if you guys don't know Jeff Driscoll's background, he was a top recruit. He was a highly recruited five-star caliber recruit. Meanwhile, Blake Bortles didn't get all that much uh, attention from, you know, the Power Five conferences, ended up staying home and playing, what, what was it, Zach, UCF, I want to say? Or mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah. regardless, <clears throat> what's ironic, here's where the irony comes in, is Jeff Driscoll gets all the college love, but then when it came to the draft, of course, it was Bortles that went number three overall in 2014, and then Driscoll ended up being whatever it was, a fourth, fifth, mid-round pick, let's just say. So now their paths cross. And Jeff Driscoll talked about it today too, Zach, that uh, yeah, oftentimes they were rivals. They were one year apart, um, but they also growing up in the same town, playing football and being the man, being the quarterbacks. They're also on the same team more than once. And so they're kind of looking, he's looking forward to anyway, kind of reunion with Blake Bortles. And, and that's, that's a nice little human interest piece to the, to the Blake Bortles edition, by the way. Zeus McPeak jumping in with a very generous super chat. Yes. We love you, my friend. Thank you, Steve. We call him Zeus in this neck of the woods because MHH Mount Rushmore, his face, first one etched up there. Appreciate you, Stu. He says, catching a flight up to Seattle, so I won't make the pod, but go Broncos no matter what. Zeus is one of our ride or die superstars and a foundational member of this community. Yeah, thank you so much, Stu, and I hope you have a, a very safe and uh, good flight up to Seattle. And uh, let us know on the next pod tomorrow how it was there. All right, uh, we do have a lot to get to today. Of course, there are a lot of questions, a lot of comments stacking up in the stream. We're going to get to you of that, I promise you. But first, just a couple of really quick matters of business, and then we'll get right back to the content, to the chat stream. Gang, make sure you head on over to sportsbetting.com the sponsor of tonight's live stream here and utilize sportsbetting.com for all of your sports betting needs. You can join today for a risk free, uh, a risk free week. That is of betting up to 500 bucks sportsbetting.com. And of course in the state of Colorado, gambling just became legal and it's on fire. A lot of uh, fans who weren't always didn't have access to this type of thing in the state of Colorado suddenly do. And we want to draw your attention to the best online site for gambling and odds and placing your bets, go to sportsbetting.com. And of course we thank them for sponsoring this live stream. A couple other quick matters of business here. Zach will uh, remind everybody, make sure you're following the podcast on Twitter at huddle up pod. And then also at mile high huddle on Twitter, you check those two boxes, so to speak, and you're not going to miss anything podcast related. You're not going to miss anything uh, breaking Broncos news and analysis wise as it relates to your team. And then a gentle reminder to check out huddle up pod, Dot com and get your swag on. Get yourself one of these MHH trucker hats. Get one of the football priest hats. There's t-shirts. There's hoodies. Let them hate. Hey, let them hate is not dead. It's still yeah. alive and well. Drew Locke's going to come back, and, and we're going to talk about how the Broncos tonight, one of our talking points we want to get to is how the Broncos are going to kind of keep the ship afloat in, in, you know, while Drew Locke is kind of licking his wounds and what the future might hold there. But huddleuppod.com, it's another way to support what we're doing here at MHH. And if you're not in a position to patronize the merch store, it's all good. Please, if you love Zach and I, if you love your football priests and what we're bringing to you on a nightly basis, make sure you subscribe. And especially if you're on Facebook or YouTube, like this video. And if you really love us, share it out there. Help MHH, help the Huddle Up podcast continue to grow and reach new like-minded Broncos fans just like you. And then one last thing, a shout out uh, to our Supporters on Facebook, if you are one of our 
still exponentially growing Facebook uh, community members, you can become an official supporter as well. Just go to facebook.com slash mile high huddle and you'll see the big blue button become a supporter. It's another organic way that you can support what we're doing here for you at mile high huddle. This is the overtime podcast network. Broncos country. I've got the perfect drink and cause for you. Listen up gang. Coors seltzer is not your average seltzer. Rooted in Coors' long history of sustainability, this brand was inspired by a generation that wants to do good in the world with a mission to restore America's rivers. Because listen up, our waterways are at risk. 80% of America's rivers are drying up. But through a partnership with Change the Course, Coors Seltzer is helping to protect and restore America's rivers. Each 12-pack of Coors Seltzer restores 500 gallons of fresh water to U.S. rivers and the communities that depend on them. The results... 1 billion gallons of water restored to 16 river basins across the U.S., including the Colorado River. And that's just year one. It's unprecedented. Four refreshing flavors, gang. One cool cause. Enjoy naturally flavored black cherry, mango, lemon lime, and grapefruit. The specs are in. Coarse Seltzer is 4.5% ABV, and it only has 90 calories. I cannot wait to try this product. And I've got my eye in particular on the black cherry. This is the type of drink that I know not only I'll enjoy, but my wife as well. She loves the fruity type of adult beverages. And with a little bit of carbonation to it, you can't go wrong. Join the world's easiest volunteer program by simply drinking Coors Seltzer. You can volunteer to restore America's rivers. You buy Coors Seltzer. You help restore 500 gallons of water into America's rivers. It's that simple. Visit CoorsSeltzer.com to find Coors Seltzer near you. That's CoorsSeltzer.com. For every 12-pack sold through 831-2021, Coors will purchase services from Change the Course to restore 500 gallons of fresh river water. Details at CoorsSeltzer.com. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Fort Worth, Texas. Winning season returns at my bookie. Winning season means doubling your first deposit. Winning season means insane props, epic bonuses, and the craziest cross-sport wagers. At my bookie, winning season means watching live sports and betting live sports all season long. Rejoice, because the NFL has returned. That means action-packed Sundays and huge cash prizes. Get in on the action, use promo code OVERTIME, and double your first deposit. New players get up to 1000 bucks in free play, which is designed to add more excitement to the sports you already love and the games that you bet. Bet with the best this NFL season for your chance to win big. Use promo code OVERTIME and double your first deposit. Your winning season begins today only at my bookie, and here's the best part. Overtime is going all in for our listeners. We're giving away 500 bucks cash to one lucky person who takes advantage of this offer. When you make your deposit, just take a screen grab of your MyBookie account and email it to overtime at advertisecast.com. That's overtime at advertisecast.com. 500 bucks given away at the end of September. All right, with that said, Zach, back to the topic of Blake Bortles. Let's just spitball for a second here. Let's say Drew Locke returns week six, all right? Nothing happens by way of the depth chart in terms of Jeff Driscoll plays, starts all three games between now and then. Is Blake Bortles still on this roster week seven? What do you think they'll do there? That would depend on Drew Locke's health and only on Drew Locke's health. If if he can give the Broncos confidence that he's fully healthy, and not only that, but at lesser risk of re-aggravation or future injury, a more severe injury, then I think that Blake Bortles would be cast aside. Um, they don't need him. I mean, if you have Locke fully healthy, you have Jeff Driscoll fully healthy, then you have Brett Rippon as your your number three fail safe, you know, the break the glass in case of emergency. What do you have Blake Bortles on the roster for? Maybe can you practice squad him? I, you know the rules this year are so weird. Can you can you slot him onto the practice squad after you cut him again? I don't know about that, but I don't see the, the necessity for uh, Blake Bortles with a healthy Drew Lock in the lineup. And you see Jeff Driscoll has shown he can keep them afloat. The only reason Bortles is here is because Lock isn't. When Lock comes back, they don't need Blake Bortles. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I don't think, and you know, one of the benefits to waiting on signing an additional veteran, because even though Jeff Driscoll is a veteran, he's still relatively untested in terms of his NFL starting experience as a, as a stopgap. But one of the benefits to waiting on adding another guy like that till after the season started is 
you know, the, the contracts, you, you have a little bit more wiggle room with regard to contracts in season and whatnot. So real quick, let's grab this super chat from Jay Ritchie, one of the superstars in our community. And thank you, Jay. Also shout out to Ariel. Hope you guys are doing great. He says, Gordon, Melvin Gordon had a solid game, just not explosive like Philip Lindsay. Predicting KJ Hamler has a big game. Him and no fant combined for 200 yard combined for 200 yards and at least two touchdowns thoughts. Hey man, as we talked about Sunday and the gut reaction, and then also again, Zach on Monday, I was absolutely impressed at how well KJ Hamler looked in his NFL debut and how quickly, yep. you know, considering how long he was, he was sidelined with that hamstring during basically three quarters of, of training camp, he was out. And so I was really surprised and impressed and pleasantly, you know, pleased to see him not only produce the way he did, Zach, and show that speed, make a few really tough catches, but also just how quickly he was plugged in and weaved into the offense, and he seemed completely natural and, you know, not like a fish out of water. So I think between him and Fant, yeah, you're going to see some some production so long as Jeff Driscoll can continue to do what he did in the second half last week against the Steelers and get the ball to his playmakers. Yeah, it didn't seem like the game was too big or moving too fast for K.J. Hamler. Got right in there and used his speed and and, and showed why he was a second-round draft pick. If this question pertains to Week 3, it depends on game flow, Chad, how the game turns out. To beat Brady and the Bucs, you either have to keep them off the field or get into a shootout with him. And I think the Broncos would prefer the former there. So if it's a a heavy Melvin Gordon-type game, you might not see a lot of K.J. Hamler or Noah Fant. But if it's a shootout, then yeah, a lot of Jerry Judy, a lot of Noah Fant, and a lot of K.J. Hamler. And what's encouraging is that Driscoll's already shown in in a half of football he has some sort of chemistry built with Hamler and Noah Fant. Those things take months to build, Chad. And he stepped all in step right in there and and hooked up and linked up. So it's encouraging that if they have to ride this out with Driscoll under center, they have the weaponry to at least stay afloat in games. Yep, absolutely. And credit to that's one area that you do have to tip your cap to John Elway and, and the front office is – they really have built the nest in the draft these last three years. And, of course, it's a shame. It's a dat gum shame that Cortland Sutton is not going to be a part yeah. of the equation any longer this year. Yeah. But still, there are so many weapons in the arsenal from Jerry Judy to K.J. Hamler. Yes, they're both rookies, but they are already in a position with their relative development in the NFL yeah. to be impact players. And then, of course, Noah Fant is a borderline superstar, uh, superstar already. And that's, in fact, something I wanted to get your take on today, Zach, because Bruce Arians in his conference call with uh, media today ahead of week three, Tampa Bay and and Denver, said that Noah Fant, in his opinion, is already one of the best tight ends in the league. Do you think that's jumping the shark? I don't. Just based on what we saw these last two two weeks, we've been talking him up all offseason about him being the Cortland Sutton-esque, you know, pop guy, quantum leap guy here in his second year. I don't think that's stretching it. He has looked like an absolute animal, which means, come on, Pat Shermer, uh, right. This is something Nick Kendall talked about and Carl Dumbler on building the Broncos last night. You can't go five, six targets a game and all of them in one half. It needs to be eight to 10 targets a game minimum. And it needs to be a consistent aspect fan of the game plan. I was so high on Noah Fant entering year two, and a lot of it was based on what he showed in the second half of last season. My only concern was not Noah Fant. It was Pat Shermer. And knowing his history and knowing his scheme of not really using a tight end, I was worried about Fant's production, especially in this offense, surrounded by the same weapons you just mentioned. But Fant has shown, Chad, he has, again, I will say, Gronkian-level talent and moves out there on the field. He just... Beats people off the line of scrimmage. He can post up like a, like a Jimmy Graham tight end. He has power. He has his right running got a lot better. His run blocking got better. The guy I would say is a borderline top 10 tight end in the NFL. I would say on the periphery of top 10, top 12 at minimum. I think he's going to make the Pro Bowl this year. Even with a little turnover at quarterback, you're going to get Drew Lock back at some point. Worst case scenario, midseason. I think this kid ends up being like Sutton and gets a Pro Bowl nut in year two. Now let's grab this super chat from one of our superstars, Christian, uh, in Las Vegas, our you, lifeguard sir. friend. Appreciate the support, Christian. It's good to have you in the stream, my friend. He says, I don't understand the tank for Trevor logic. We already have a franchise quarterback. We just need to protect him. Tackle should be the top priority in next year's draft. And this is a topic that I think, you know, has obviously we've, we've addressed it twice now on this podcast. This, this is going to be number three, uh, it took on a little bit of a different shape because, of course, Eric Trickle produced an article and a video 
yesterday on, on Tuesday evening that said, look, it is concerning that in two years in the NFL, Drew Locke has had two injuries that have cost him serious time or will end up costing him serious time and both to his throwing arm. The Denver Broncos, in light of that, have to start looking at quarterbacks in the NFL draft. He's not advocating tank for Trevor. He's not advocating even go get a quarterback in the first round. All he's saying, really, his, his bottom line premise is the Broncos now have to, unfortunately, go from just kind of scouting some of the mid-round guys or whatever, looking for long-term backup caliber guys, but they have to also start looking at the higher round prospects in this class, including uh, Trevor, including um, – Oh, what's his name? I just had a brain fart, the Ohio State kid. And just the top quarterbacks in the class, it now has to be a part of the repertoire, so to speak, for the scouting department, just because you don't know what Drew Locke's going to look like when he comes back. Just just being pragmatic, they have to look at it. Now, Drew Locke, when he does return, Zach, he can completely put a kibosh on all of that by getting back to being the guy we both believe that he can be, but it now does, I think, become a question in the front office. That doesn't mean the team gives up on them. That, that's not what anyone's saying, but it now becomes an issue I think they have to at least look at. You mentioned that we don't know what Locke's going to look like when he comes back. We don't know, Chad, what Locke looks like with one full season as a starter in the Broncos system with a full complement of weapons. So can we at least get that or half of that before forming an opinion on Drew Locke being the future cornerstone player of this franchise? As it pertains to Trevor Lawrence himself, I'm not going to call out Broncos fans or or lump or or make sweeping statements about Broncos fans' fandom if you're rooting for the Broncos to lose. In terms of Lawrence, though, keeping it realistic, they have to get the number one overall draft pick or be in position to trade up to number one. And there's no way they're going to lose intentionally, and there's no way they're going to get the number one overall draft pick. It, it's just not going to happen. They have too much talent on this team to finish – Three and thirteen, two and fourteen. The Giants are looking like, or the Jets, one of those teams is number one overall draft pick. It's not going to be the Broncos. You want to talk about Fields? You want to talk about other quarterbacks in the draft? That's fine. But Trevor Lawrence, I don't think is bound for Denver, if only for the simple fact they're not going to be in a position to draft him next April. And again, it comes down to what you believe he can be in the NFL. People are calling him generational. I don't see that. I see a good prospect, maybe a great prospect. I don't see Andrew Luck. I don't see Peyton Manning. But I think it's a moot point when the Broncos aren't going to be in anywhere near his range. And for what it's worth, I do expect Drew Luck when he returns to play well because, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And I think he's going to come in and just like you saw last year, initially there will be quite a little spark getting him back with the offense and the whole team will be lifted. And it'll be a matter of this time around sustaining that because, you know, let's say he misses three games and we're grabbing Ron right next year. Uh, let's say he misses three games. If Jeff Driscoll can win one of those, all right, one and four start is not good, right? It's bad. It's it's not ideal. But five games in, if you're one and four, and you get Drew Lock back, you're going to still have plenty of ro- a rope, plenty of opportunity to put the foot to the to the gas pedal and force your way into the playoff picture. It's not going to be easy, and the the odds are going to be stacked against you. But what can you expect with the way these injuries have just decimated the Broncos? Sure. But it's going to be on the tables. I can let's grab. Uh, Ron Dub here, long-time listener, big-time superstar in our community. Always brings really insightful yes. questions. Thank you, Ron. He says, uh, hey, guys, long time. Signing Bortles is more important than quarterback protection. Right, ta- uh, right tackle position, I see. I just don't understand their thought process. <sighs> right there with you. Yeah, we don't know. Uh, you know, Zach's joked about what kind of compromising pictures <laughs> Elijah Wilkinson has on Bronco Brass there. But, yeah, we are at a loss, man. The only thing – I don't know if you missed Monday night, Ron – um, but the only thing that, that I can chalk it up to is, you know, three, they're, they're on the hook no matter what for 3.2 million for Elijah Wilkinson this year on the RFA tender. Meanwhile, the, you know, I think it's a million dollar might be, I don't have it right in front of me. It's either 750 K or a million dollar base salary for DeMar Dotson. If they end up benching Wilkinson, whether he plays again or not, they have to pay him 3.2 million. So they're holding on to the fact that, look, we'd rather just pay 3.2 million and a million dollar base salary to DeMar Dotson as opposed to having to pay 3.2 million. And then Dotson hits all of his performance escalators. Now we're paying 6.2 million for right tackle. Other than that, Zach, I really don't know what it could be. 
Who cares if you're paying $6 million? It's still cheaper than J- Juwan James would have been this season. I don't understand. Is $6 million not worth having a, a top-10 offensive line or keeping your quarterback healthy? Uh, Ron, I'm wait, right there with you. I'm sure mo- most Broncos fans agree. They would sign a washed-up quarterback before they would address right tackle, the position that got the quarterback killed in the first place. I- I'm not going to touch on it too much. It could be money. I happen to think it's Munchak. He just has some man crush for whatever reason on Elijah Wilkinson, and he thinks he's the one that can make him a competent right tackle. And as revered as Munchak is, Chad, if that's the case, he is dead wrong here. Dead wrong. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. In case you missed it, sports gambling has been legalized in the state of Colorado. Whether you're looking to place your first wager or you're a seasoned betting professional, sportsbetting.com is the place for you. With sharp odds, a huge range of lines, props, and futures, and backed by state-of-the-art data security and encryption, sportsbetting.com gives you all the tools you need to maximize your sports betting experience. Sportsbetting.com is a legal and licensed sports book in Colorado, so with a fresh slate of games coming up in the NFL this week, plus the NBA playoffs, plus college football, you name it, head on over to sportsbetting.com and get in on the action. Again, Elijah Wilkinson, he's a great try-hard guy, but the Broncos need great, good guys. Yeah, I do. I think he's a guy that's a lunch pail guy. That's when, when the coaches say, we need you to do X, he gets out there and he does the best he can. But the best he can is very limited player, especially on the edge as a tackle with that slow foot speed. I mean, it's like, you know, you can you can make your bed, you can comb your hair, shave. <laughs> book. When he gets between kick slide number one and click, uh, kick slide number four, Quarterback's already crushed. Uh, Bronco Batman jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, looks like a very lovely backyard that you got there, doing a little Bronco barbecuing. He says, I think we can be 2-2 two and two at the first quarter of the season. So in order for the Broncos to be 2-2, two and two, obviously, that would mean an upset victory at home because the Broncos are home dogs in the wake of Drew Locke's uh, injury. It did affect the odds slightly. And I think even if Locke was healthy coming out of week two, if they losing, you know, to the Steelers, they still would have been home dogs to Brady and the Bucks, but not quite by what they're at right now. It would take an upset over the Bucks and a emphatic win on the road against the Jets on Thursday night football. I don't think that's asking the world, but let's see him stack that first win. And uh, you know, hey, Tom Brady, as we know, he has struggled traditionally at mile high. My only concern this time around is that Von Miller has always kind of had a big part of the equation as to why Brady has struggled at mile high. There is no Von Miller this year. So it'll be incumbent upon the Bradley Chubbs and the Jerry attachers, but especially Chubb to finally bring the thunder in week three. And hopefully he'll be motivated Zach, because looking across the field at the reigning sack champ, Shaq Barrett, who used to be your backup, that ought to put your, if that doesn't get your dander up to get out there and, and show what you can do. I know you're coming off an injury. I don't know what will. Yeah, very well said there. I'm not really worried about the Buccaneers. They're a formidable team. They have some talent, obviously, on offense. I'm not even worried too much about Brady and the Bronc and and Brady and the Buccaneers offense. I'm worried about, like you just mentioned, Shaq Barrett versus Elijah Wilkinson. I I mean, if if TJ Watt, I know he's a better player than Shaq Barrett, but just having any elite pass rusher one on one, you don't have Cortland Sutton now. You might not have Phillip Lindsay. You might, you don't have Drew Locke, obviously, in the lineup. If they can score some points, easier said than done. Touchdowns, not field goals. They can beat this Buccaneers team. The Jets, no team is a gimme, but the Jets are truly awful this year. They should walk right all over them. So two and two at the quarter mark, it, it's it's literally not implausible at all. I would say there's a 60% chance they can pull this off. Jeff C. jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. Bonafide superstar in this community. Thank you, Jeff. He says, uh, Jerry Judy just seems irritated when interviewed. Just my take. He snapped at Andrew Mason. Fangio needs to step up as head coach and stop focusing so hard on being a defensive coordinator. Hashtag Denver Broncos for life. Yeah, I did see that today, Jeff. Uh, it's not the first time you guys have mentioned, uh, have heard me mention before on this podcast. <clears throat> the last two, well, ever since week one with the drops, he's always been short with media, at least as a pro up to this point from the time the Broncos drafted him. But especially after week one, I think he feels a little bit beleaguered and somewhat harassed and under the microscope. He has taken on a very dismissive tone with media. His answers are short. They're clipped. When one of us in the media tries to ask him something that might suss out a little more insightful question, he still keeps it short, <clears throat> kind of thumbing his nose at media and just making it clear that, look, I'm not interested in talking to you guys at all like this. I'm only doing this because PR put me in front of you. 
I couldn't care less about talking to you guys. There's a billion other things I'd rather do. And that's okay. I, that doesn't bother me, to be honest with you. And, but I think a lot of it right now, kind of his mood and his tonality is fueled, Zach, by, the, by his feeling that he has so far kind of, you know, fallen short of the mark. Even though he hasn't been terrible, but those three drops, three clear drops, two of them in really clutch situations, I think is really kind of nagging at him. Yeah, there, there could be a few reasons here. He seems like just an ornery guy off the bat. Personality-wise, that could be what it is. Could be the fact that he's not the highly tatted receiver in this draft class. C.D. Lamb is performing better than Jerry Judy right now. He might be a competitive guy. And also, he came from Alabama where he had his ass kissed every single day for years and years and years about how great he was. He was a big fish in a small pond in Alabama. And it's crazy to think about. It's such an NFL factory. He was. He was an elite talent there. He gets to the NFL and he's dropping passes, he's facing criticism, he's now a small fish in a big pond. So I think that's weighing on him. He hasn't lived up to his standards. The team is losing. How often did he lose at Alabama, Chad? Everything, right. the weight of being an NFL player in his first year in a really weird year, I think is just kind of coming down on Jerry Judy. And that was something that was brought up today as well in his presser is, hey, man, you're not used to losing. What's this been like for you? He provided no insight at all. I mean, he's just like, <laughs> next question, please. But, but I think Zach's right that that's a part of the equation in terms of trying to make sense of his kind of standoffishness. Just this side of hostile, just this side of hostile so far in the Zoom. I, I, I mean, I'd love to have seen him in these two <clears throat> press situations, Zach, in an actual podium with a scrum around him because I yeah. think – it would maybe soften him a little bit because you know how it is with the internet. I mean, we deal with it as content creators and NFL <laughs> analysts. You know, the internet sure. breeds the toughest commenters in the world, right? That would never say to you in person uh, right. what they would say to you in a comment. And I think there's an aspect to that, only a reverse psychology aspect for, for the player, you know, that maybe they don't necessarily feel like they need to be as warm and bright when it's coming through the internet. But Could nevertheless, <clears throat> let's grab Isaiah 1127. Appreciate you, my friend. Not Thank a name, you. Zach. We recognize on no. Super Chat. Welcome. Welcome in, my my friend. It's good to have you. Um, actually, now that I see your profile pic, I do recognize you. But I don't recognize your handle. Maybe you changed it. Either way, appreciate your support. Zach is 100% right. We need a change at right tackle ASAP. Our DBs are going to get tested again. Is Devontae Bosby going to get to start versus Tom Brady and company? No, I, hope. I don't. I don't think so. <clears throat> However, excuse me, frog in my throat there, uh, my throat. <laughs> Look, Fangio stood up and defended Michael Ojemudia after his welcome to the to the NFL kind of rookie moment game in Pittsburgh. Same thing with Lloyd Cushenberry, who had an atrocious game as well in Pittsburgh. I at this stage they can't really risk benching him because they've thrown in with him, and now you have to worry about. You know, do we destroy this young kid who we have all these hopes and dreams and belief in? Are we going to destroy his confidence by suddenly sitting him down? But, Zach, you don't have to bench him. You can still work in Devontae Bosby a heck of a lot more without actually sitting down Ojemudia for the whole game. I think they would be remiss to not get Bosby in there a little bit more. Devontae Harris is still banged up, did not practice today. Uh, so bo- the onus is more on Bosby. I, I mean, uh, the coaches, I should say, to get Bosby on the field. I just don't think it's going to happen. I think you're going to see Ojemudia, Bassey, and Callahan as the primary three once again, barring injury. Yeah, I'm not interested in manicuring Ojemudia's feelings. He he should have caught the interception. He should have played a little better. He's a rookie. He's been doing well. But if Bosby can be give the Broncos defense a boost and be better than Ojemudia against the Buccaneers, I'm going to play that guy. And it comes down to, Chad, you and I are bigger Bosby fans than the Broncos coaching staff is. And for whatever reason, they like Ojemudia more and Duke Dawson more, Devonta Harris more. But, at, you know, by default, I think Bosby, considering the injuries now and facing a team with a lot of weapons on offense, they're going to have to play. Like you said, titles don't matter. One, two, three, as long as you have the best cornerbacks on the field and you can help defend the pass, that's all that really matters. Yeah, indeed. Here we got Cody Potter, one of the superstars, jumping in. Appreciate you, Thank my you, daughter. Cody. He says, could Blake Bortles be a better quarterback than Driscoll with Wilkinson at right tackle? LOL. Bortles, a better runner than a passer. Ask the 2017 Steelers. Hashtag Brady 8-9 versus Denver. Um, you know, here's the thing is Driscoll is a, is a pretty big, mobile, athletic quarterback himself. Right. And, uh, you know, I think he's got a pretty solid 
physical constitution, but so does Blake Bortles. Blake Bortles, big guy as well, but nowhere near the running athlete. I mean, the Broncos, to be frank with you, now that they have had a week to scheme and whatnot, they'd be remiss to not utilize some RPO for Jeff Driscoll and try and get him on the move running outside the pocket because that's what he was known for coming out of high school as a recruit. I mean, he was like, he was on a lot of you guys might not remember this because not everyone plays pays close attention to SEC football and recruiting, but I mean, he was hailed as basically Tim Tebow light coming out of high school that he was going to be the next Tim Tebow because he was such a bona fide, powerful, dual threat type running back in, or uh, quarterback. And Zach, he ended up becoming, oddly enough, what's ironic is he ended up becoming more of like your quintessential West Coast offense quarterback than, you know, the running dual threat guy. But he's got that in him. So I hope we do see some of that because anything you can do to mitigate that pass rush, get the edge guys thinking twice before they just crash down uh, the line, you know, that's that's a plus. Yeah, keep the uh, the Bucks pass rush on their toes as well. Maybe keep Shaq Barrett at bay. I think I read somewhere that Jeff Driscoll' career rushing average is in excess of like five yards a carry. So they should definitely have him get out there, design runs, bootlegs, play action, utilize his legs a little more. And to the question, I don't want to find out Blake Bortles starting a quarterback with Elijah Wilkinson at right tackle. I don't want to know what that would be like, Chad, at all. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Amen. All right, we got... Smouse in the house, y'all. Everybody knows Z-Dub Designs, the designer of, first of all, bona fide superstar member of the community, yes. bona fide MHH Mount Rushmore guy, and also the brainchild behind the Mile High Huddle hashtag, let them hate shirt on the merch store. He's rocking it right there in his profile pic. He's a guy that uh, we love and we appreciate you, Zach. He says, why doesn't Elway focus on strengthening the team around Locke rather than just signing another veteran bust? I understand that Locke is young. But don't underestimate Locke at all. Locke will be our franchise quarterback. I feel I, I love the optimism and and unflinching, unwavering support for Drew Locke, and we feel that we're with you along, right alongside Zach. I honestly don't hate the Blake Bortles signing. Like they had to go out and find someone because clearly they don't believe in Brett Rippon as that all that stands between us and abject disaster if Driscoll goes down is Brett Rippon. They're not having any of that, and so. I don't really hate the Blake Bortles edition. I don't, you know, we can clown on the guy being the, the modern version of, of Mark Sanchez. And there's a lot of truth to that because, you know, he basically the Saxonville Jags defense in 2017 dragged him kicking and screaming to the AFC championship game. And if we can all think back to that game in, in Foxborough, the Jaguars should have gone to the Super Bowl. Like they blew a massive lead and allowed Tom Brady and company to fight back and end up advancing to the Super Bowl. He's got those that experience, and that's not easy to find when you're sitting here three weeks into the season, and you know he's still relatively young. So I don't hate the idea as a fail safe's fail safe. I really don't. Um, but to your point, Z Dub, about you know not building around Locke, I don't see that anything the Broncos in terms of transactions in the last week since Locke got hurt. I don't see them having done anything, Zach, that. Uh, isn't or can be viewed as not building around lock or doing something other than that. It's just a matter of now we got to make some different arrangements till we get our guy back. They did everything, though, correct, Chad. I brought this up on the halftime stream of the Pittsburgh game, that they did everything in their power this offseason, fired coaches and, and drafted and signed and, and got receivers and offensive linemen. You have a awful right tackle right now, and you signed his replacement or would-be replacement. The final step of making it truly the year of lock, at least in Denver, was putting a better right tackle in the game. So you might not hate the Bortle move, but you have to hate the logic of getting a quarterback before getting a competent right tackle. And where's the accountability? What message does that send, Chad? We're going to replace the quarterback before replacing the guy who's gave us the reason to get a quarterback. It doesn't make sense to me. I, I, yeah. Bortles is fine for what he is. He's a warm body for now to hold a clipboard. But until yep. Wilkinson's out of the game, it's not going to make a difference. Duke, good to have you back in the stream, my friend. I'm glad to have you with us. Duke reminds me of something, having him in the stream here, because I know Duke, like many of our community members, and frankly, many of us at Mile High Huddle, were not happy, not pleased with the – overzealous fine that the NFL slapped on Vic Fangio on Monday for not perfect, uh, perfectly wearing his mask on Sunday against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Of course, Fangio was one of almost a half dozen NFL head coaches that got hit with a hundred K fine. 
and then their respective teams, including the Broncos, having to pay also 250k fine themselves. And Fangio kind of broke his silence on that today, and addressed it, and said, "Look, I just got to do better. Um, you know, I have to take my mask off to call the play, and then sometimes I forget to put it back on. And, and then also, when I have the mask on, it fogs up my glasses, and I can't see, so I got to pull it down to look at the play sheet. This and that. He's 62 years old. The dude can see nothing." <laughs> when he's got his glasses off, right? So um, the the suggestion obviously is do what Andy Reid's doing. Get yourself one of those shields that <laughs> those, those beekeeper masks. Yeah, and you, you know that's that's the solution. But Duke, I feel your frustration because honestly, let's let's face it here. This fine and look, we're all about safety and uh, preventative measures with regard to the bug that shall go unmentioned here. The NFL, Zach, has done a phenomenal job. We've credited them yes. since this whole thing started yeah. for managing to not only continue their season <clears throat> and keep it going, um, but they've bottled it up. They've, they've bottlenecked entry into these facilities, into these teams for the virus, and they deserve credit. But I think they're going a little bit overboard here. This is an optics issue. This is the NFL in their own way kind of virtue signaling that right. they are taking this with the utmost seriousness Pandering. and um, you know, Vic Fangio got hit and he's going to have to, he said he, he's learned his lesson and that's that. And he's going to fix it and whatnot. But uh, I did, I, I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you that it did bother me. And you know, Vic Fangio, he's probably making three and a half, four million a year as the head coach of the Denver Broncos, hundred grand in the, in the, in the grand scheme of things, Zach, it's a drop in the bucket with, with regard to what he's probably going to make by the time he's, hangs up his his uh, coaching, his whistle and his clipboard and whatnot. But as a guy who preaches to his players, he's known for being a financial guru, preaching to his players about holding on to their money, being smart with their money, you know, not letting financial predators as a pro and a famous athlete get to your money and investing. This is what he's known for, both as, assist, as an assistant, longtime assistant, and as, as a head coach as well. So it is utterly ironic that he just lost 100K in his bank account. Yeah, I am with you, though, on the point you made. It seems like the NFL, and they've done a tremendous job, you know, mitigating the virus and the spread. They really have. i got to give them credit. But it seems like they're going out of their way to say, see, guys, see, we're, we're, we're keeping it safe. We're keeping it socially distant, socially responsible. It's pandering, and it's that same, like Chad said, that social virtue signaling like we saw last six months. Not going to get into that whole other subject. Um, I wonder, though, why do they have to wear masks on the sideline if everyone's tested before the game? If everyone's tested either way every single day, why do they have to have masks? I I don't know about that. I did have to laugh, though, at Fangio, what he said. He goes, I, I'm wearing a mask because they asked me to. And that was, I think that's relatable for literally 90% of the population right now. I know when I go to a store or get a haircut or anything, I have to wear a mask. And the only reason I'm doing it for the most part, they asked me to. And I'll do it. I'll comply. Let's be honest. It's optics. That's that's really all it is. They're they're making an example of this handful of coaches because it really is optics. They want to maintain nothing but praise in uh, you know the media landscape and from outside eyes you know that aren't in the NFL and even NFL writers and NFL networks and publications. They want to be untouchable with regard to their attack and approach for the pandemic. And so this is them setting an example and. Fangio is one of the casualties, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, we got Terry Randall jumping in up there north of the 49th parallel, proving, as always, the Broncos country is not a geographic location. It is a hashtag state of being. Thank Seven you, sacks, 18 QB hits. Enough said. Talking about the Pittsburgh games at. Mm, 18 quarterback hits. And you know what? It seemed like all 18 were credited to Elijah Wilkinson. He didn't go down <laughs> that way, but God, yeah, every single – Every single drive back, it seems like a quarterback was under pressure. That those were staggering numbers, Chad. Wow. How do you not change alignment after that game? We got uh, Ed Keating <clears throat> jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. Long Thank time listener and superstar. He's got the football priest hat. He's got the football priest tee. He says, thanks for everything, Chad and Zach. Can I get a let them hate shirt? Denver Broncos for life. Edward, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do, my friend. Uh, we will see what we can do. And uh, we'll maybe be doing some giveaways here in the very near future. In fact, we've kind of gotten away from that. We probably need to do one here um, soon. And uh, we'll see what we can do, my friend. Also, we got Aaron Lynch jumping in, one of our longtime listeners. And to our knowledge, the only time he's probably not listening daily is when he's out on a boat trying to make a living in uh, off Alaska, off the coast of Alaska, trying to commercially haul in some some fish. Appreciate you, Aaron. Thank you. He says, I'm half tempted to buy myself a Bortles jersey. 
I never thought I'd have the chance to get one of those in orange and blue. And if I can understand the decisions being made, might as well go all in. Now, I got a question for you, Aaron. Do you believe that Bortles is coming in to immediately uh, supplant Driscoll? Because I don't. And I know some of what you're saying here, you know, tongue in cheek a little bit here. But, uh, Zach, I really don't think Bortles is coming in to replace Driscoll. He's, pl- he's played in a lot more NFL games. He was a, you know, five, five year starter in the NFL. I mean, he played in a few playoff games, two playoff games anyway that year in 2017. You know, he's seen a lot, but obviously left a lot wanting as well with his play. And he wasn't in camp. And, you know, he's going to have to learn on the fly. And even though you've got Pat Shermer and Mike Shula, who are QB whisperers in their own right, and, you know, you've you got to believe that that could help. I just don't think there's enough time between now, Zach, and when Drew Locke comes back to just go ahead and leapfrog Jeff Driscoll with Blake Bortles, who's coming off the street cold. And and Driscoll deserves to start at least the next couple games. I mean, he earned that job in Pittsburgh, Chad. And I, the Broncos, see, my heart says there's no way they're going to replace Driscoll with Blake Bortles coming in cold. My brain says Elway being Elway, the same guy who made a big deal by getting 34-year-old Joe Flacco, making him the franchise quarterback, you never know if he can shoehorn Bortles in there if Driscoll is very nondescript the next couple of weeks. But what blows my mind, Chad, last point I'm going to make, in a span of two weeks, we went from <laughs> watching Drew Locke as the potential franchise quarterback, and now we're, we're having to deal with Blake Bortles. Where did this season go wrong? What happened, Chad, that Blake Bortles is now a Denver Bronco? When you think about what's transpired, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. It's just terrible luck, man. It's just bad luck. <sighs> the, the injury bug is no respecter of persons, and it is no respecter of teams. And, you know, we've questioned that maybe there's got there's there's got to be some underlying reason why this is happening to the Broncos. But there's no way to verify that. There's no way to prove that. I think it's just you got to chalk it up to bad luck. At or this 2020. Point. And I 2020 guess. being what it is. I mean, um, but obviously the Broncos have been inordinately affected by the injury bug. Them and yeah. San Fran. But I'd still give the edge by by quite a uh, – a distance to the Broncos in terms of being affected by the bug. Um, David Kilgore jumping in, longtime listener and Thank bona fide you, superstar. Still, every time I, I every time I see that uh, profile pic, Zach, I just tear to my eye. Yeah. Love it, dog. He says, "I'd love to have a let him hate shirt, but I need a five X, please, and add bigger sizes. I would order the shirt and hoodie." So, David, unfortunately, on the sizing issue, we currently don't have any control over the. Yeah sizes we can offer just with you know when the when the orders get placed zach and i are not the ones you know screen printing the shirts and then you know sending them out we use a third-party provider all right that does that for us we provide the designs we you know upload it into the system when an order comes in they get it they process the order they you know do all the fulfillment they ship it out and so we have to own all we can do is list what their options are and because of uh, requests like yours and others in the community for bigger sizes, we have made sure that every time we list a new shirt, it goes as far up as they they have available. Zach, I think the biggest I've seen them offer is 3X. Yeah, but we'll, we'll put in a, a, a DM to them again and say, hey, when can we get some of the 4X and 5X? And, and as soon as we get any movement on that, we'll be sure to let you know. Yeah. Uh, Derek, yeah, awesome, man. Tip of the cap to you and the missus. Good to have you in the stream. Let's grab here Mr. Boggins. Everyone knows Mr. Boggins was in the, the stream with us. Was it last week? Yeah, it was Wednesday last week, right? I'm pretty sure. Sometimes, now that the season's starting, Zach, everything becomes a blur for me. So yeah. if I get my timelines a little screwed up, forgive me. Appreciate you, my friend. He Thank says, you. we need to get Fant more involved. Amen, dude. Amen. <laughs> Hats off. Booyah. Agreed. Look at what the Raiders did. They made sure they fed their best players in Jacobs and Waller. And yes, now part of that, Zach, is having a quarterback who can, you know, who's not overwhelmed, who's not everything going a mile a minute, um, who can recognize the mismatches, prioritize where to feed the ball. I think for the most part, Driscoll did a good job of that in the second half. My, my point, and I'll echo what Boggins is saying here, Zach, is from a design perspective, Someone needs to get the memo, hopefully, you know, it's evident and obvious, to Pat Shermer 
feed this animal because Noah Fant is indeed an animal and he is knocking at the door of greatness already, but you got to give him the targets. He's too fast uh, and, and explosive for linebackers and safeties. You, I mean, even Mika uh, Fitzpatrick last week really struggled keeping up with Noah Fant and he's too big, strong and physical for corners. He is a, a matchup nightmare. The onus is on the OC and the QB to feed him. And what's the underlying message you're saying there, Chad? Coaching. That's yes. what it comes down to. I mean, the Raiders, you talk about Derek Carr. He's a more experienced quarterback and stable quarterback than what the Broncos have right now. But he did lose Tyrell Williams. Henry Ruggs is not playing at 100%, and they're playing a tough Saints defense. So for him to for them to win that game by utilizing their best players and not ignoring them for halves and quarters at a time comes down to coaching. And we said I said this on the halftime pod. We said this on the on the gut reaction pod. The Broncos have the talent, even with, with all these injuries taking place, to be competitive or win ball games if the coaching is just a little better and the situational management and play calling is a little better. They can win this season, Chad. It all comes down to coaching. Shout out to Albert Knoppers, who is not only a superstar on uh, YouTube in our community, but also a bona fide. Facebook supporter. Much love to you and the missus as well. I'll give you. our best to her. And we echo uh, what you're saying. Sometimes we got, you know, Zach, especially, you know, he, he spits fire sometimes and it might not always be what everyone wants to hear, but it's just <laughs> what he thinks. That's his, that's his take in that it is what it is. Um, got to keep it right. real. Got to keep it real. Let's see here. Um, from Jeff, this is a good question. I know we're at 48 minutes, so we got to hustle through these awesome superstars, but I want to grab this one. Jeff says, why do you think Locke doesn't stay in the pocket? He always rolls back. He needs to improve, period. Truth, truth, absolutely. He does need to be more mindful and disciplined. And as much as we panned Vic Fangio on Monday night for saying, I wish he would have stepped up on that play, he got hurt, you know. But in, de- in Fangio's defense, again, he was asked directly if Watt could have done anything different to protect himself on that play, what would you like to have, him to have, to, to have done? But in this case, Jeff, I think what you got to keep in mind, too, is you don't think Locke recognizes what's going on with Elijah? And y- this is why the Broncos need to do something here. Obviously, they expected to have Juwan James, the right tackle. They're paying for the privilege, and it, he opted out. But it's on the Broncos to do everything they can to avoid turning him into the next David Carr, Drew Locke, by getting him beat up and just yes. punch drunk, seeing shadows, jumping at, at monsters and the whole nine yards. I think that's an aspect of it. But it's more of a smaller aspect. I think it's just Locke's tendency to, because he's the athlete, he's a, he's a point guard basically playing football, it's his tendency to break the pocket, get on the move. He's more comfortable on the run than he is chilling in the pocket. But he does, if he's going to develop and become uh, anything even approaching a Patrick Mahomes caliber quarterback, and he has the talent to do it, the natural talent, it's between the ears and it's the poise and it's the, you know, it's the overall football brain and all that. He's got to learn to make his living in the pocket. And like we talked about on Monday night, you're safer. It might sound counterintuitive because the whole pocket is collapsing around you and, you know, three, four, five bodies are, are coalescing on that one point. But quarterbacks, are, are safer in that pocket than they are getting out. There are a few exceptions, but think about it. All the major injuries, uh, and I mean like you know season-ending injuries you see the quarterbacks, and just off the top of my head, Aaron Rodgers, collarbone, outside the pocket. Uh, Trevor Simeon's kind of gruesome injury, outside the pocket. Those are just two off the top of my head. Lock, outside the pocket, boom, shoulder. You got to stay in the pocket, Zach, and it's going to not only prolong his career, but it's also going to make him a better quarterback in terms of allowing the play to develop the way it should and letting his tackles and his offensive linemen know, I don't have to guess where my quarterback's going to be. And there's a lot of confidence. It, trust me. It helps offensive linemen to know that their quarterback's going to be in the pocket unless, you know, it's just insane pressure off the snap or something like that. If I remember correctly, I believe the old uh, breeze injury was outside the pocket as well. So you're right. Yeah. Bad things happen. You know the expression, bad things happen after 2 a.m.? Bad things happen for quarterbacks outside the pocket. And to answer the question directly, it's on lock, yes. It's his natural tendency to kind of fade back and throw off his back foot and play backyard football. 
but it's also on the offensive line. And you saw it in Jeff Driscoll. I tweeted this during the game. If Driscoll was doing it, he was stumbling backward and fading backward. It's a product of having a consistently inconsistent offensive line that constantly allows pressure into the quarterback's face. It's how they see ghosts. It's how they get happy feet. It's how they get injured. It ruins a quarterback's development. You mentioned David Carr. The modern-day equivalent is Josh Rosen. Arizona took him high up in the draft. They plopped him in there with nothing protecting him. They allowed him to get killed, and that's why you see him now sitting in the sands as a practice squad quarterback. I don't want that for Drew Locke. And that's why replacing Wilkinson was such the easiest step to make, and they didn't do it, and it got Drew Locke injured. So he has to be better when he comes back. It's not throwing off his back foot, but not having a consistent offensive line where he can be confident in Chad – that's also doing it. It's a big mental aspect to it. Chris Hernandez jumping in, 24-year veteran of the Air Force and bona fide superstar in our community, and a skate punk veteran. This is a guy Chris and I have a lot in common with our relative history as, as young men. Shout out to you, my friend. He says, with all the injuries for the Broncos, who could be a breakout star like a phoenix rising from the ashes? Ooh, I love that uh, that verbiage. And, of course, Hashtag click those little thumbs up. Reminder, gang, Facebook or YouTube especially, while you're watching, while you're here with us, even if you're only in the stream with us for two or three minutes, whatever, like the video before you X out. You guys, it helps us out a ton. But, Zach, to answer Chris here, someone that might not necessarily, you know, let's remove the no offense. Let's remove the, I mean, I guess you can't really say Melvin Gordon. He's already considered a star, two-time Pro Bowler. Who would jump to mind for you here with Chris? The easy answer is Hamler, because he already showed it last week with Sutton out of the game. But I'm going to go a little deeper and say Tim Patrick, because that is your starting X receiver outside right now with Sutton out of the game. So he's going to get volume and targets based on the snaps he gets. And I know, Chad, you think he's more of a jag. I think he has a little more talent than that, uh, but he can be a big beneficiary of Cortland Sutton's injury. And, And when Drew Locke comes back, they showed last year they have chemistry. And if they continue to hook up, he could finish the season on a very high note. Yeah. I mean, I don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I don't hate on Patrick, but I, Zach's right. I do view him closer to the Jag, you know, orbit than I do bona fide guy, but opportunity can change that. Opportunity can, you know, um, pave the way for developments that you don't foresee. I mean, so I'm, I'm with you on that, Zach, that he and offensively anyway, I think you're right. You got to land on Hamler and you got to land on. Yeah on Tim Patrick because everybody knows Jerry Judy. No one's going to view him as a breakout star. He's already a star. He's a first round pick. He's right. Alabama, you know, uh, national champion and all that. Kenneth Booker jumping in. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you, Kenneth. Love having you in the chat stream. And Kenneth, are you on Twitter? Because there's a time I've tried to tag you the other night and I'm like, I thought he was on Twitter. No, and I couldn't find you on Twitter. So if you are just beat me over the head with it, reach out directly either in DMS or in the ads and say, hey, this is me, here's my handle, because it might be different for all I know than your YouTube handle, so let's connect. Uh, But appreciate the super as always, my friend. He says, Hamler got a run or short pass and didn't have the burst I thought he would have. Wow, because I I saw burst. Um, I actually saw it the opposite, Kenneth. I mean, look, the purported 427, it's purported, all right? Vic Fangio did some kind of fuzzy math watching him return a punt uh, as, as a Penn State Nittany Lion and, you know, basically said that he thinks he might even, might even be faster than 427. But he's fast. He's explosive. I didn't see anything that, that uh, countered that narrative with regard to Hamler in his, you know, five or six touches the other night. I didn't either. I came away impressed, and that long reception that he had, it was separation, and that was his speed on display. So he was showing all the the skills and the abilities that made him a second-round pick. And this is coming from two guys, Chad, and you and I, who were kind of panning that pick when it was made. I thought Handler was really good last week. All right, let's grab Levi jumping in. Just loving the the activity and the support, my friend. Just really blowing us away. We support, or uh, we appreciate your support more than we can say. And, um, you know, we got a T-shirt coming your way, as, as yeah. we talked about on Twitter today. So thanks, my friend. Very generous, and it means a lot. goes a long way, as, uh, as Terry says here. Cheers. Appreciate you, my dog. John, do you have Big Kev Peterson and Gavin and consistent as the day is long, 
Mike Evans super uh, super chats. If you have those guys, let's get them up next because the stream jumped them on my side. There he is, Big Kev in the house. Love you, you, buddy. Appreciate you. He says Spencer and Hamler end around or sweeps, draw plays, screen passes, play action, some RPOs this week, and a new right tackle with. Eyebrows. Hashtag <laughs> shave 68 eyebrows. Man, that would be a sight to see. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, Spencer, I don't think you're going to see crack the lineup unless there's injuries, additional injuries to the wide receiver core. But what I do think you'll see is a little more from Tyree Cleveland. I think, you know, unfortunately Sunday was his birthday, if I'm not mistaken, week two for Tyree Cleveland. And uh, he didn't dress. Not the greatest birthday omen if you're Tyree Cleveland, but – I think he's a guy that's, you know, I don't see him as being a breakout star, like but going back to the previous question from Chris, but he's a guy that could end up making a lot more hay as a rookie than we foresaw early on, even once he surprised us by making the roster. But, yeah, your point, though, remains the same, Kevin, especially, in my opinion, as it relates to Hamler. Find a way to get that dude the ball. Find yes. a way to get that dude the ball in space and where he's already on the run and, you know, watch great things happen because he is an explosive playmaker. And you might see some more razzle-dazzle against teams with good pass rushers like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to mitigate the pass rush and keep their quarterback uh, upright to score some points until Locke gets back in the lineup. Hamler should be involved, Chad, in almost every offensive snap with Cortland Sutton out of the game, Philip Lindsay out of the game. You need that firepower on the field. Deontay Spencer, no, but K.J. Hamler is going to have a big rookie year, bigger than we anticipated after the Sutton injury. All right, we're buttoned right up against the one hour mark. And tonight we have to keep it a little bit, a little bit closer to, to right on that one hour mark than uh, we have been lately. Got a few things I got to take care of tonight. Uh, as it relates to my son, Gavin jumping in, superstar. Appreciate you, my dog. Thank you, Gavin. He says, Elway is cheap tank for. <laughs> I read that wrong the first oh, time. Can't say it, but tank for, you, you know, he's making a joke here. <laughs> love y'all. We love you too, Gavin. And uh, we do love the funny, but, you know, we got to keep it family friendly uh, on this me. show. Uh, yeah, that's just the way it is. Mike Evans, there he is, bona fide superstar. Love you, bro. Uh, appreciate you. He says, do you feel like K.J. Hamler or Tim Patrick will have more of an impact over the next few games? So let's just say over the Driscoll window till Locke comes back, what would your answer be for Mike? Because I'm picking Hamler, but what do you got? I am too. I, I, they had a better, you know, chemistry off the bat. He, he found them down the field, and I think the Broncos will take advantage of Hamler's speed. You know, Tim Patrick, I, I love him a lot, but he's a, a very one-dimensional receiver. KJ Hamler just offers more, and I think Shermer knows with Sutton out of the game and Lindsey, like I mentioned, you need all the weaponry you can get. So I think Hamler is the bigger beneficiary. All right. I'm communicating with our producer to get the next super chat up because the stream on my side has just been hot and heavy. Love the conversation, man. Love the passion. There he is. Also one of our longtime listeners and superstars in the community. And one of our favorite YouTube profile picks as well, the hat and the face mask, the combo is just so clean and tight. Looks good, dog. Appreciate you, Drew. Drew. Wilkinson is a backup guard at best. Agreed. And he's starting at right tackle over a veteran like Dotson. He's part of the reason Locke is out now, yet nobody has considered benching him. And we got Shaq Barrett coming. Hey, man, your point is not lost on us. And, again, part of these these live streams with your football priest, we're here to help you exercise the demons. And sometimes, you know, we're going to commiserate right there alongside you when it doesn't make sense to us. And it doesn't make sense to us either. We don't understand it. We don't get it. It's either money or or it's DeMar Dotson is just sucking it up in practice. There's no other explanation, Zach. Unfortunately, we just don't see it changing in the first quarter of the season. I don't think they're going to make a move. The third door here is that Elway and Fangio have complete and total you know, faith in Mike Munchak, and Munchak has autonomy to make that decision, which I can't see. I can't see Elway uh, acquiescing any power to anyone other than himself. So uh, it's got to be money or, or Dotson looking that bad. But if Dotson's that bad, let me just say again, why is he on the team then? Find a better right tackle. This isn't complicated. All right, let's grab here if we can get him, if we can reverse injury if we need to. Buana. Gustavo Lopez, if we got him, there he is. Love you, Gustavo. Thank you, Gustavo. Appreciate your support. If you're on Twitter, make sure you reach out to Zach or myself or Zach and myself and even better and connect with us so that we can start tagging you and showing you some love and shout outs on Twitter after the show. He says, what would you guys do with the cap space we have? 
Hmm, that's a good question. Um, honestly, I would, because right now it's it's on D line. It's McTelvin and Ajim, and then a massive drop off. You got Deshaun Williams chilling on the practice squad. It's a virtual guarantee he's going to be activated game day active as one of the fifty five men rule on Sunday. And then they just signed former Bronco last year, college free agent. The the practice squad guy had a few games on the active roster, appeared in one game. Deion Sizer, he's back. Uh, on the practice squad, that is, but spend a little money to get some D line help while Draymond Jones is on injured reserve. And then also Demarcus Walker today, Zach, just got put on injured reserve. So both those guys are gone three weeks, no matter what. I would say a little, put a little money if you can, depending on what's out there on D line. And then if you're not going to play Dotson, yes. find someone that can be an upgrade to Elijah Wilkinson. Beyond that, Zach, I think at this stage, you know, maybe go out and get – I'm still waiting for them to to get a more proven pass rusher. Look, I know uh, – I don't think you and I even talked about it, the signing of Anthony – what is it? Chick- Chickalo. Chickalo. Uh, we haven't even addressed it on the podcast. We It's one of these minor um, Broncos omissions on our part. We usually miss nothing in terms of our conversations with you. But, look, I know he's got ex- some experience, and, you know, he's a third phaser guy too, but it, he's not the answer that's going to come in and help let's say, get you 60% of the way there, what you're missing from Vaughn. You need a guy that can do that, like a T-Sizzle, like a Clay Matthews. I know they kick the tires on Matthews, and I know they kick the tires, Zach, on on Cameron Wake. What about T-Sizzle? Why is why aren't they right. trying to make it happen with T-Sizzle? So that's what I would do, Gustavo. Yeah, all these guys they picked up, these these linebackers, Mark Barron, Austin Calitro, Anthony Chicolo, they've made no difference. They're all literally Jags. And Mark Barron, what a great signing that was, Chad. Now he's on IR, so he hasn't contributed a snap to Denver. I don't know. I would say get a right tackle, but they got one already. They're not playing him. So being realistic, I say roll the cap space over, pay Philip Lindsay next offseason, pay Cortland Sutton, pay Justin Simmons, and lock up your core. I mean, they're going to roll it over for next year when the salary cap is going down. I think they're going to do it to lock up some of their own. I would hope that's the case. And it's not just McManus gets that golden ticket and, and, and nobody else. All right. Shout out to Manny Wise. Unfortunately, the chat stream did jump your super chat. But let me tell you why. I really respect and appreciate and love Manny here, the wise man, as he goes by on Twitter. Manny oftentimes doesn't see eye to eye with Zach and I. And a lot of times opinions differ between the two of us and Manny. But Manny is diligent and consistent and loyal listener to the show, shows love on Super Chat. And so, Manny, we appreciate you, Doug. We really do appreciate you. And we value you being in the in the stream and in the community. Yeah, it wouldn't be fun if we all agreed all the time. So right. I like the, the discourse and the disagreements and the and the debates. I live for that. So, Manny, we appreciate you for sure. All right. We really do have to move quick on these remaining superstars. We don't leave anyone out in the cold as it relates to our superstars. Mr. Castillo jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. You. If you're on Twitter, reach out. Let's connect. Do you agree that Elway's worst move ever was picking Brock Osweiler ahead Ooh. of Russell Wilson? It's up there. I know they did like Russ. But I think that Jack, you know, his son, Jack Elway, his father's name was Jack, and then he named his son Jack after his dad. But uh, their connection in, um, at Arizona State between Jack and Brock and that whole, the way it all developed, I think, just colored his, his view on things. But that's up there. Yeah, I agree with Zach. It's up there. But I'd, I'm, I'd have to think about it before saying it would be the worst move Elway ever made. I mean, it's it's tough, though, because a lot of teams passed on Russell Wilson. It's like saying they 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 drafted Pax and Lynch over Dak Prescott in 2016. I mean, how many teams made that mistake, too? So the quarterback misses are up there. Osweiler, Pax and Lynch, hiring Vance Joseph, just set the Broncos back a couple years. Joe Flacco, pretty much any quarterback move Elway's made in the last five years is tied for number one, Chad. Yeah, pretty much. Almost. Not quite. We we're, we still uh, we <laughs> still got eyes for Drew Locke, but we're, we're there with you. Uh, WE jumping in. Appreciate you. And if you're on Twitter, reach out as well. Thoughts on Herbert, another young QB that looks the real deal. The AFC West will be challenging for years to come. I'm not quite on the Herbert train yet. He did. Yeah. He was impressive against the Chiefs. Credit to him. But he's a guy that, I'll be honest with you, if he would, because remember, there were rumors he was going to come out in 2019. He ended up staying for his senior year in Oregon. So had he come out in 2019, I know it might seem blasphemous to the draft community out there. I liked Locke more than I liked Herbert, even though Herbert, you could argue, had some better measurables and whatnot. I didn't, I questioned him as, as a leader. 
I, I wasn't sure about his, you know, just kind of his his leadership persona as a as a franchise guy. And maybe he has it in him, and it's going to come out. And and you know, the, the Chargers will suss that out of him, Zach. But you know, I want to see him do it a few more times before I go head over heels right. about Herbert. But yeah, props to him that they shouldn't have lost that game. I was more impressed with Herbert than I thought I would be, but that was like a letdown game for Kansas City. They should have lost that game, Chad. I mean, they gave that game on a silver platter to the Chargers. I will say, though, the fact that Herbert looked that good on short notice is a testament to, again, coaching. If a rookie quarterback can come in and almost take down the reigning champs, that is a testament to coaching. But how about Tyrod Taylor? The fact that he didn't play because he got injected in the lung by his team physician before the game. That's I never heard that one before, Chad. That, yeah. that was a new one. Agreed. Big Kev jumping back in. Appreciate you, my friend. Thank until you. they take Wilkinson out, well, I'll say it the way he says, until they take 68 out, let's start 28 at quarterback. <laughs> Talking about, of course, the fact that Royce Freeman was listed as the emergency quarterback in week two. He's used to the pounding as running back and may hold up. I don't want Driscoll to die. <laughs> QB live. <tonight. laughs> All right. Good joke. That's what um, we're at right now. I know it's a concern though, dude. It is a concern. You know, Elijah Wilkinson, it's just scary. And we're just so we're with you guys. We're sick and tired of having to complain and worry about right tackle. It's just gotten so old and played out. We're sick of it for years now. They just can't find a a right tackle. All right. Let me see. I, I think we're close to being caught up here. Let me just do one more once over. Uh, shout out to Mr. MRM5897. Appreciate that thank super you. chat, my friend. Another name I don't recognize, so thank you and welcome. And hit us up on Twitter. Connect with us on Twitter so we can shout yeah. you out. We get a lot of we get a thrill doing that on Twitter. Here's Drew again. Love you, buddy. Thank I you. I would Drew. love Clay Matthews, but I'd gladly settle for Suggs. We need somewhat of a pass rush. Yeah, Zach. Again. At least this time they didn't go four weeks. You know they didn't get they didn't wait till the fourth week to get their first sack. But in two consecutive games, only one sack. The first one from Jerry, the second one from Purcell, the defensive tackle, and uh, not good enough. I'm sorry, you get just not good enough. So why are you waiting? Why are you sitting on your thumbs? Go pay Suggs. You know you got that cap space for a reason. Go use it to help your team. Improve. You don't think Terrell Suggs, even at his 37 years of age, is a better option in terms of putting pressure on the quarterback on third down even. All right, you don't want him on first and second down. You like Jerry there, fine. But on third down to come in and utilize that 15, 16 years in the league to get after Tom Brady this weekend, I put my money on that situation opposite of Bradley Chubb, more being able to get home more than I would what they have now. Yeah, I mean, that's that strikes me as Fangio being stubborn and thinking he knows best. But I wish you would just pressure more, blitz more. You're never going to get home if you play coverage on every single passing down, Chad. Send five or six guys. Don't send three and four. All right, Tom El Greco. Appreciate the super chat, my friend. New also a newer well. name. Yeah, really, welcome. really do appreciate it. Welcome and reach out to us on Twitter, my friend. Let's connect. And then also uh, MRM. Provided a super sticker and a thumbs up. So thanks for that. And then another super chat here. Again, we don't leave any of our superstars out in the cold. MRM, really appreciate you, my friend. And if you have any direct questions or topics you want us to broach before we get out of here, we will keep an eye on it and try to get to it before we got to bounce. One last thing. Let me just double check the back side here and make sure we're not missing anybody. We hate to do that. Uh, we got Drew, we got Tom, we got MRM, we got WE. I think we're caught up. So, guys, sorry to kind of abruptly shut this one down tonight, but I got a, I got a couple things I got to take care of here with the fan. Kenneth says we missed a super sticker. Ooh, where is that? Let me look here. Let me see if I can find it. Um, there's that one from Kenneth. Was it from Kenneth? I assume he's the reason he's saying it. Uh I only see one that it's showing me on in the admin on YouTube, but if we missed it, we will circle back and uh, of course give props and credit address it on uh, tomorrow night's show. So thanks to each and every one of you, MRM shout out to you again and to yeah. all our new super chats, uh, superstars in the super chat here tonight. We, uh, we love having you and we welcome you and make sure you reach out on Twitter. But in the meantime, guys, we got to bounce out for tonight. Zach and I though, it's Wednesday. 
Tomorrow's Thursday. It is our favorite episode of the week. We'll have one little topic we'll broach to get started, depending on what the news cycle is tomorrow. And then it's straight to the Mile High Mailbag, talking to you guys, whatever on your mind. And, of course, we always try to balance the Mile High Mailbag as best we can. We always are going to prioritize our superstars, but we try to keep the Mile High Mailbag as balanced as possible with non-superstars as well. So if we didn't miss or if we missed your question tonight or we didn't get to a question or a topic you wanted us to address, circle back tomorrow night. We'll do our best to get to you then. Promise you that. In the meantime, gang, make sure you are following the podcast on Twitter at Huddle Up Pop, also at Mile High Huddle. My partner, Zach Kelberman, at Kelberman NFL, myself at Chad and Jensen. And remember, before you bounce out of here, like this video. Super important, organic way to help us fight the robots, all right, at these social media companies. It's another way to kind of hack the robots here. But thanks to each and every one of you. Zach, we'll see what Thursday offers by way of news. It's going to be fun. It's to, to see how this team responds against yep. Tom freaking Brady. Of course, we'll probably direct a little bit more of our attention tomorrow night, Zach, too, to preview and uh, Broncos Bucks. Yeah, and uh, our favorite pod, like you said, Chad. And I saw Brian Greenfield in the comments section. He had a question for me. We'll get to you. Save it for tomorrow. Come back tomorrow. I'll answer it for you. Anyone else have questions saved up? Hit us up on Twitter. Come to the pod tomorrow night. It's our favorite mailbag topic, Chad, to, to dive in and answer all Broncos fans' questions. So looking forward to talking to you guys then. We've been on for an hour and 12 minutes. It's felt like 12 minutes to me. Right. I mean, honestly. So credit to you guys for keeping us coming back. And just we love this is our the bright spot of our day. So shout out to each and every one of you. Thanks for everything you bring to this community. Each and every one of you are vital and important to us. So thank you for joining us tonight. Mile high salute to our Super Chat superstars and Facebook supporters. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. And shout out to John in the booth, of course, Buona Beast. We'll see you tomorrow night. 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.